Hi folks, I want to welcome you back to our Prophecy Series. And we are in Lesson 3 today of our introductory material to Biblical Prophecy. And today we're going to focus on a broad overview of the different viewpoints that are out there concerning the Millennium and the Second Coming. So what we're going to do with this lesson is kind of give you a basically an overview of the positions, not a very detailed look, but just an overview of some of the positions that are out there concerning viewpoints that exist today in the church that some would have, even sometimes a mixture of, concerning the reality of the millennium and the second coming. So we're going to look at five different viewpoints that are out there, and we're going to take them one by one. Now, as I go through them, you're going to realize, yeah, I've heard of that, I know of that, or yeah, that's my position. So that's our whole purpose today, is just to give you an overview of these positions. So let's begin, and what we're going to start with is known as the dispensational premillennial view. Now, why do we call it the premillennial view? Well, it is the viewpoint, if you remember our definition of the millennium, the millennium is the thousand-year kingdom that Jesus sets up. Well, with the premillennial view is, is that the return of Jesus Christ is before the millennium begins. Now, let's talk about the dispensational part of this premillennial viewpoint, okay? So, with the dispensational premillennial view, Jesus Christ will return to earth literally and bodily after a seven-year tribulation. So with those who hold to this view, they believe that Jesus Christ will literally and bodily return. Now, why is that important? Because there are some who would say, well, Jesus has returned already, not bodily, but spiritually returned. With a dispensational person who holds to the premillennial view, their belief is, is that Jesus Christ literally comes back bodily, and it's at the end of the seven-year tribulational period. The seven-year tribulational period, if you remember from our definition in our last lesson, is that period of time in which God's wrath is poured out on the world. So Jesus Christ will establish his kingdom, which he will rule for a thousand years. So he will establish a literal kingdom where he is the king ruling, of, ruling from Jerusalem for a thousand years. In his kingdom, all of Israel's covenant promises will be fulfilled. So remember all of the promises that were given to Abraham to Moses, to all of the other patriarchs, to David, they will find their fulfillment in the millennial kingdom, in this thousand-year kingdom. Now, this view believes that the rapture and the second coming are two separate events. Now, the rapture is mentioned in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Now, with the dispensational premillennial view, they believe that that event is a separate event from the second coming of Jesus Christ, which is found in Revelation chapter 19. Most dispensational premillennialists believe in a pre-tribulational rapture. So most of those who are dispensational would say that the rapture will take place before the seven-year tribulation as the church is removed from the earth before God pours out his wrath on the world. The reference to Israel in the book of Revelation refers to Israel, not the church. So remember, I told you in the last lesson, you've got to decide what you're going to do with the nation Israel. Who does it represent? And that will determine how you look at the prophecies concerning the second coming. Now, with the dispensational viewpoint, they view Israel in the book of Revelation as meaning the people Israel. It's not the church. 
This belief emerged in the 1800s among the Plymouth Brethren. And one of the well-known Plymouth Brethren of that time was a fellow by the name of John Darby. He is often connected with the dispensational premillennial view. It increased in popularity in the late 1800s and remains the dominant view in the North American church. So that's what we see here. It remains the dominant view even to this day. Emerges in the 1800s, the late 1800s, and it re remains the most dominant view. Now, that brings us to our second viewpoint that we're going to see concerning the millennium. And this second view is called the historic premillennial view. So again, it's a premillennial view, but it's known as the historic view. But what you're going to see is that it's different from a dispensational premillennial view. So this view believes that Christians will remain on the earth during the Great Tribulation. So with this viewpoint, they believe that Christians will endure that time of tribulation when God pours out his wrath on the world. The tribulation, according to this view, will purify the church. So with that wrath being poured out, God's church will then be purified. The second coming will precede the millennium. As with the dispensational view, this view also believes that Jesus Christ will return to establish his kingdom. So it will be before the millennium. Now, the historic premillennial view, so historic premillennialism believes that the church has replaced Israel as God's covenant people. This is also known as replacement theology, that God is no longer focused on Israel, but that the church now has become spiritual Israel, and that has replaced Israel, and the church will receive the covenant promises. Now, with this, this seems to be the earliest view of the end times among Christians who lived just after the apostles. So this view would be a prevalent view in the time after the apostles, the last apostle being the apostle John who died in the 90s AD, and so this is the prevalent view at that time. So it's an ancient viewpoint. That's why it's called the historic premillennial view. Now, let's go to our third view, which is the postmillennial view. Maybe you've heard of it. Well, let's talk about it. It is a belief that the second coming will occur after the millennium. Now, with premillennialism, it is the viewpoint that Jesus comes back and establishes the kingdom. With a postmillennial viewpoint, Jesus comes back after the thousand-year reign. The millennial reign represents a period when most of the world will be reached with the gospel. So that's what a premillennialist believes, that most of the world will be reached with the gospel. So therefore, God's kingdom is established on earth. During this time, Satan will have no power over the earth. And so they go to the book of Revelation where it says that he will be bound for a thousand years and he'll have no power over the earth. Christ will rule the earth through his spirit and the church, but not physically. So again, with this viewpoint, Jesus is going to rule in that millennium through his spirit and through the church, but not physically rule. The Great Tribulation may precede the millennium. That is based upon those who maybe hold to the post-millennial view. That could happen, but that doesn't necessarily mean that all believe that. The church will establish God's reign in human society. Now, you see some of this viewpoint 
being seen through some of the churches that emerged in the Western world where they saw it as the task of the church to affect society and to bring about change. This is where this comes from, this post-millennial viewpoint. After this, Jesus will return for the final judgment. So when Jesus returns with this viewpoint, he's just going to judge all of humanity. Now, this belief was first mentioned in the 11th century. So this is not from the beginning of the church, but I would say at the midpoint in the 11th century, this viewpoint emerges. Now, during the 1800s, post-millennialism increased in popularity. So there was a resurgence of the post-millennial ideas and viewpoint during the 1800s. Well, that leads us right into the fourth viewpoint, which is kind of similar to the post-millennial viewpoint, but it's called the amillennial viewpoint. Now, why is it referred to as ah? Ah is a negative. So it's a viewpoint where there is no literal kingdom. So in this belief, the millennium is the spiritual reign of Jesus in the hearts of his followers. So do you see the difference now? With amillennialism, they don't believe in a literal kingdom. With postmillennialism, they believe it's the society that has changed because of believers and his spirit. Here, with amillennialism, the belief is, is that it is Christ's reign in the hearts of his followers. The kingdom of God is God's reign in the world through the church. So what is seen is, is that the kingdom of God is shown to the world through the church. This view denies that the nation Israel has any future and the church is the new Israel. So this view sees no emphasis or no, no position whatsoever concerning Israel. So they would look right now in the Middle East at the nation Israel, and they would say that has nothing to do with what the Bible says. They have no future. The future is the church because, again, the church is the new Israel. Again, replacement theology. So there is no literal kingdom on earth following Christ's return. So they believe that Jesus will return, but they do not believe that there will be a literal kingdom. So the Great Tribulation represents the wars, disasters, and persecutions throughout church history. That's what an amillennialist would say. This belief became popular in the 5th century and has remained throughout church history. It is very possible that you know somebody who is amillennial in their viewpoint. This is a very prominent viewpoint that is out there. The most prominent in North America is premillennialism, but it would be followed by those who have an amillennial view. So that brings us to our final viewpoint that we're going to talk about in our lesson today, and that is preterism. Now, this view holds that the prophecy of scriptures refer to events that have already taken place. So with those who hold to this view, they would say the prophecies have already taken place. So the book of Daniel refers to the events that took place in the second century BC. They would view as that concerning the reign of Antiochus Epiphanes and his persecution and his desecration of the temple, that what is happening in Daniel is referring to him, Antiochus Epiphanes, and those events have already taken place. Now, the book of Revelation refers to the events that took place in the first century AD. So, Ancient Israel finds its fulfillment in the church with the destruction of the temple in A.D. 70. So with those who hold to a preterist viewpoint, A.D. 70 is significant. 
If you remember, AD 70 is when the Romans came, laid siege to the city, defeated the city, carried away the Jews into exile that they did not kill, destroyed the city and the temple, took away its treasures, and that basically was the end of the Jews in Jerusalem. Jerusalem was destroyed. And so to a preterist, ancient Israel finds its fulfillment in the church after the destruction that happens here. While some hold that the view was held in the early church, it appears in the 17th century. Now, what, what I mean by that is there are some who would say they're preterists and they would say, oh, this is an ancient viewpoint. No, it's not an ancient viewpoint. It is something that appeared in the 17th century. This view was first advocated by the Catholic Church to counter Protestant beliefs about the end times. So if you remember, during the Reformation period, there was lots of teaching from those who were Protestants concerning the end times. And so this view emerged initially with the Catholic Church to counteract those beliefs concerning the end. Some held that Emperor Nero of Rome was the Antichrist. And that's with those who saw Revelation as being a fulfillment of the events of the first century. The tribulation then refers to the Jewish war and affected only Jews and not other people. So when they read Revelation, it talks about the destruction upon the world. They would say, no, no, it's not on the world. It's the destruction on Israel and the Jews during the Jewish war. Now, the interesting thing about preterists is, is that there are two groups of preterist belief. There are those who are partial preterists, and there are those who are full preterists. So partial preterism and full preterism. Partial preterism holds that all the prophecies and judgment occurred in AD 70 except the second coming and the resurrection of the dead. So they would say everything was fulfilled in AD 70 with the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. But that does not include the literal return of Jesus Christ, and the resurrection of the dead. Full preterism believes that all occurred in AD 70 with the destruction of Jerusalem. So they would believe that Jesus Christ came back in AD 70. They would also believe that the resurrection of the dead has already occurred. Now, full preterism believes that the second coming is symbolic of the judgment against Jerusalem, against the Jews. That's what a full preterist would hold. Now, here is the interesting thing that most don't really grasp, but they need to, because this viewpoint is out there. Partial preterists, and, and they would be in some of the Reformed <coughs> denominations today, they view full preterism, because of their belief that the second coming has already taken place, and their belief that uh, the resurrection of the dead has already occurred, they would view full preterism as heretical. So that basically they are spreading heresy. And so this is what we see. Partial preterism views full preterism as heretical. Now, that brings us to the close of Lesson 3. Now, when we get into Lesson 4... Again, we're going to look at different positions that are out there, and with Lesson 4, we're going to focus on the viewpoints concerning the tribulation, that seven-year period of judgment, as well as the second coming, with reference to the issue of the tribulation. And that's what we're going to focus on in Lesson 4 in our next lesson.